Hello, Storyline. This is David Asherick, and I have the privilege of presenting a message to you today. Ty and Yamil asked me to uh, come in and, and make the presentation, and I'm super excited about what we're going to talk about. But I just want to say, before we get into that, that Ty Gibson is such a good guy. I've known him for years, more than a decade now, actually. He's the kind of guy that would give you the shirt right off his back. Yes, in fact, I'm wearing Ty's shirt. And so if it looks great, uh, you can give him the credit for it. So really excited to be here with you in Storyline. Today we're going to go through a presentation that I absolutely love. It's a brand new presentation that I've only delivered two times before. And so this will be the third time, and you know what they say about that. The third time is a charm. This is a presentation in which we're going to be making our way uh, through a fairly long introduction. I want you just to be aware that there's going to be here might be a good way to think about it. We're going to have an incredible meal toward the latter half of this presentation, and that meal is going to consist of two passages from the Apostle Paul, uh, what I consider to be two of the most formative passages in all of Paul's uh, writing. One of them is theologically formative, and the other is methodologically formative. We're going to get there, but before we partake of that delicious meal, and it is going to be delicious, I assure you of that, we're actually going to spend a fairly significant amount of time setting it up. And so we're going to be setting the table and putting the placemats out and getting the chairs just right and the silverware and everything just so. So that's where we're going to start. And the presentation is titled The Gospel Tribe. And so we're making our way eventually toward two central passages in the writing and thinking of Paul, Galatians 3 and 1 Corinthians 9. But on our way, we're going to spend a significant amount of time setting the table so we can really appreciate the deliciousness and the profundity of the meal itself. And so the Gospel Tribe, you're going to absolutely love this. I hope it will be maybe even, this isn't an exaggeration to say, revolutionary in the way that you view yourself and the way you view the world around you. I want to start by introducing a phrase to you that has become kind of part of the new parlance. And that phrase is perhaps even a phrase you yourself have used, and I'm sure you've heard it, a new normal. Right? You've heard that before. We talk about a new normal. And, and most recently, of course, living in the context of a global pandemic, part of that new normal is that we wear masks and we socially distance, we stay away from people. All of these sort of new normals, and you think about the word normal actually means things that you do habitually or things that you do routinely. And so when we talk about a new normal, there's almost kind of an inbuilt paradox to the phrase itself, right? Something that we're doing routinely and habitually, but that we didn't used to do, but we now are doing. And so that's the sort of catchiness of the phrase and the descriptiveness of the phrase. A new normal, a new way of thinking about things, a new way of doing things, a new way of, of traveling, of relating, of talking, and of doing life. Well, not just in the context of the global pandemic, but one of the most significant ways in which this phrase, a new normal, takes on real modern significance and meaning is this idea, or this way. We live now in a time of such incredible technology, particularly with regards to information technologies, that it's almost even difficult to remember what life was like before these technologies began. Right? This is a new normal. I'm 48 years old. I have two teenage sons, okay? 18 and 19. My two teenage sons do not remember the world before the internet. They don't remember the world before smartphones. They don't remember the world before uh, uh, Google. Th th this is their world. I remember that world. And if you're over about the age of, say, 30 or 35, you also will remember that old normal. But now we live in a new normal, and this impacts the way we drive, the way we navigate, the way we access information, the way we do basically everything, the way we communicate. This new normal has introduced to us a, a speed of technology, particularly with regards to the transmission of information, uh, getting information from a website, but also communicating with our family and friends. I mean, we carry these things. These things are like appendages, right? It, I, I mean, I can't tell you how many times in a week I will say to my wife, who always knows, where's my phone? Where's my phone? Where's my phone? Now, just imagine, for those of you that are old enough to remember, Go back 20 years and imagine trying to say, where's my phone? Everybody would have said, what do you mean, where's your phone? Your phone is on the wall. Your phone is on the counter. Your phone is where it's always been. But now these things, they're actually so much more than phones. They're like pocket supercomputers. And there's actually some very interesting sort of uh, relative you know, computational power 
there's some, some fascinating analyses, I should say, about the relative computational power of this iPhone that I have in my pocket and the computers that were used to get a rocket to the moon and back, right? There's more computational power in this thing that I have in my hand, and I'm going to just slide it into my pocket. And so we call it a phone, but a phone is actually kind of an understatement of what it actually is. It's a supercomputer. I, I, it's my daily planner. It reminds me about appointments that I have. It's how I connect via social media. It's how I do so many things, how I navigate around, how I read books, how I listen to podcasts. It's a pocket supercomputer, and it's the new normal. It's basically always with me. Chances are you're watching this video. Yours is in your purse, or it's in your pocket, or maybe you're even reading. Uh, you've got the Bible open on your phone, your phone, which is really your pocket supercomputer, part of the new normal. Well, I watched a documentary probably two months ago now that was describing some of the significant upsides, and we are well aware of the upsides of this new normal, the, the immediacy of, of having technology, it's available, we can look up anything we want, we can learn anything, we, of course, there's a lot of upsides to it, nobody would deny that. Right? We get lost much less often than we used to get lost. We're not writing directions on the back of an envelope or on a napkin. We just, we just look it up on our pocket supercomputer. So there are some upsides, but a fascinating documentary was released in 2020 titled The Social Dilemma. And in this documentary, I don't know if you've seen it, but I just want to say this, and I rarely say something like this. You need to see this documentary. Notice I did not say, oh, you'd enjoy it or you might like it. No, you need to to see it. And one of the reasons you need to see it is, I don't know if you can read the, the, the top line there, but it says the technology that connects us also controls us. There is a lot of upsides to this new technological normal that we live in, but there are some significant downsides. And in The Social Dilemma, what the filmmakers do is they basically go and interview some of, about a dozen, 10 to a dozen of some of the people that were on the very ground level of the creation of and the scaling of the internet and social media, things like Facebook and Pinterest and Twitter and, and uh, uh, what's the other big one that I'm forgetting? Instagram, right? So these are some of the people that helped create these uh, programs and they're the CEOs of some of these companies and they're the ones that were responsible for the scaling of these technologies. And here's the fascinating thing. When they're interviewed, they're not saying, like, you know, in infomercial style, oh, this is the greatest thing that's have ever happened since sliced bread, this is the best thing since chunky peanut butter or anything. No, no, no. They're actually saying there's some real downsides here, some significant downsides. And there is a, a kind of certain deliciousness to listening to the creators of these technologies look back, not 100 years later, but just five years later, 10 years later, and retrospectively say, we kind of created a Frankenstein. We were so busy doing things that we could, we didn't stop to ask ourselves if we should. Okay, fascinating. So there's almost this sort of Frankensteinian element where it's alive, you know, something has been created and we look back now retrospectively and they're saying, not just me saying, the creators of this technology and the CEOs of some of these companies are looking back and saying, um, yeah, maybe we didn't think that through as carefully as we could have. Sam Harris, uh, well-known author and public intellectual, has said, when it comes to social media and the information technologies that, that drive them, we are all participating in a giant lab experiment that none of us collectively signed off on. N none of us said, yeah, let's, let's do a giant lab experiment. We have no idea how it's going to impact us. Let's do it to everybody in every country of every age. And yet, that's the world that we're in right now. And so, in the context of the social dilemma, a number of people are interviewed describing the dangers of social media. And one of the people that's interviewed in there is a person that really, he's probably my favorite person that was interviewed. He really caught my mind and my, I, there's, there's, there was a certain sort of charismatic quality about him. In this particular picture here, he doesn't have the big glasses on that he has, but in the video, he's got these giant glasses on. You can see long dreadlocks. And uh, just a really cool, eccentric kind of a guy. His name is Jaron Lanier. And I was taken by him. And so after I'd watched The Social Dilemma not once but twice, it's that good, you need to watch it twice, I went back and I just did a little research on some of the people that were interviewed in the film. And one of the guys, Jaron Lanier, was my favorite guy in the film. 
And I learned that in 2018, Lanier wrote this book. And I want you to just look at the provocative title of this book, 10 Arguments for Deleting Your Social Media Accounts Right Now. Right? Notice the urgency. Notice the imperative. 10 arguments. What? That must sound like absolute crazy talk to your average teenager or 20-something. Delete my social media accounts? You might as well tell me to chop off my right arm or end my own life. Right? Now, again, for those of us that are a little older, we remember the pre-Instagram world, the pre-Twitter world, the pre-Facebook world. And this is one of the fascinating things that Lanier talks about and The Social Dilemma talks about. For those of us that are a little older, we are able to import the very human ways that we used to interact with one another into our new way of sort of doing social media. But for people like my sons, my teenage sons, this is their new normal. And Lanier makes a very, I would say, persuasive case. It's not a long book. It's a book, a book worth reading, um, about 160 to 180 pages. And Lanier, right at the outset, he's very clear. He says, look, I'm not telling you in some authoritative fashion, you must do this. What I'm saying is you should be aware of the dangers of social media, right? And, and here's the, what I liken this to. I'm a rock climber. I've been a rock climber since I was a teenager. I absolutely love rock climbing. I train to rock climb. I rock climb as often as I possibly can. I take trips to go rock climbing. I am aware that there are significant dangers associated with scaling cliffs that are hundreds or thousands of feet tall. I know there is a danger, and I engage in the activity anyway, but at least I know the danger. If you're going to kayak down that river, you might choose to do it, but you should know there are dangers associated with it. The problem with social media and what the the creators of The Social Dilemma and people like Lanier are saying is we need to let people know, and especially young people, who are, who are thriving and surviving, but in some cases dying on the currency of others' affirmation. I'll get to that in just a second. Um, you should be aware that there are dangers. You can scale that cliff if you want, but there are dangers. You can kayak down that river if you want, but there are dangers. You can surf that wave if you want, but there are dangers. You can have social media accounts, but there are dangers. And Lanier sets out his case in 10 arguments, and I'll just race through these arguments with very little commentary, but I want you to just hear the force of the arguments, right? And we'll just go through these quickly, and I think you'll be really stunned by them. Argument number one, says Lanier, is you are losing your free will. Now, just very briefly by way of observation, could there be anything more important to a human being, a free moral agent, than losing your free will? The answer is no. There could not be anything more important, more pressing, more urgent than that. And Lanier makes this incredible point, and so does The Social Dilemma. He says, you are making what you think are free decisions, but they're not free. They're actually being manipulated and, and controlled by these giant information technology companies. Argument number two says Lanier, quitting social media is the most finely targeted way, finely targeted way of resisting the insanity of our times. I'm going to talk more about that insanity in just a little bit, but we're still setting the table. Argument number three, says Lanier, social media is making you into a beep. Now, I don't use the word that Lanier used, uh, but I just inserted the word worse person, okay, because I don't talk like that. But he's saying social media is drawing out the worst aspects of what it means to be a human and not always um, also bringing out the best aspects of what it means to be human. It's making you a worse person, he says. Argument number four, social media is undermining truth. Truth, which I actually appreciate the fact that Lanier takes a modernist view of truth, not a postmodernist view, which denies the existence of truth. Argument number five, says Lanier, social media is making what you say meaningless. Argument six, social media is destroying your capacity for empathy. Just a brief word on that. Again, as somebody who's over the age of about 35, I can remember what it's like to interact with real humans in real time, in real space, and I can carry the empathy, the understanding, the awareness that texting and social media cannot pick up on all of the nuances of tone and body language and posture, but that capacity to understand and to empathize and to read, to think of it this way. To see a person not just as a creator of digital information, but as a whole human being, Lanier says we're actually losing that capacity, particularly among the young. Here's a big one. Argument number seven. Social media is making you unhappy. There are actually already preliminary studies on this that are indicating, particularly for young people, 
that the proportion of time that they spend on social media does correlate in a significant percentage of the population with their fundamental unhappiness about the world around them and most importantly about themselves. I'll just say one word about this. In The Social Dilemma, one of the people that's interviewed is a person that worked as a computer programmer for Facebook. And he was actually the guy who came up with the idea, are you ready for this, of the like button. The like button, right? The thumbs up, the heart, the, ooh, I like that, click. And he says this with, with considerable naivete. Again, think Frankenstein. We created, it's alive! You know, we created something, and then we look back and think, we didn't make what we thought we made. He says what we thought we were making was a way to increase positivity in the world, man. Hey, great photo, thumbs up. Great pithy saying, thumbs up. Ooh, I like that quotation, heart. He says what we actually created, the dark underbelly of this, this culture of affirmation was we created a currency where people actually had their own sense of self-worth and then evaluated the worth of others based on the affirmation, in many cases, of people they don't even know. Right? And so he says, social media, Lanier makes this profound case, is actually decreasing your happiness. Argument number eight, social media does not want you to have economic dignity. One of the great pithy, punchy lines from The Social Dilemma goes like this. If you're not paying for the product, you are the product. Let that sink in. When you download Instagram to your phone or Facebook to your phone or Twitter to your phone, you don't pay anything. Why not? Is that because the creators of these technologies are just so generous, they're so magnanimous? No, 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 don't worry about it. Have it for free. It's on us. No. The reason they're doing, it, doing that is not because they're being magnanimous or, or large-hearted. It's because you're not paying for the product. You are the product. With social media, your behavior is able to be changed incrementally, increasingly, and this is the most important part, profitably. Your behavior modification is able to be monetized into companies that are trying to get you to behave in certain ways. And so he says, you are losing your economic dignity. Argument number nine, Lanier, social media is making politics impossible. Hello, have we ever lived in more politically polarized times than we are right now? I myself am personally aware as a pastor of one, two, three good families, great families, solid families, that have had major political fallings out in the last four years. Why? Well, this is actually getting right to the heart of the thing I want to talk about. Why is social media seemingly exacerbating the incredibly hostile political climate in which we find ourselves? And then finally, Lanier just puts his cards on the table, man. He just puts it out there and says, here's the 10th reason to delete your social media accounts right now. Social media hates your soul. Now here again, you should not read Lanier's book as an authoritative, you must do this, but as a warning sign, like, sure, climb that cliff, surf that wave, kayak that river, but be aware, there are significant dangers. And it's right here that we take our first pivot. This idea of politics and the insanity of our times and social media hating your soul, one way that social media and the media more generally are overtaking our better impulses is seen in the rise of what has been called Modern tribalism, tribalism. Now let me just pull my phone out of my pocket, my pocket supercomputer, and read to you just a few books from Amazon. So all I did is I went into Amazon and I typed in the word tribalism. Well, before I did that, I actually just Googled tribalism. And if you're familiar at all with Google metrics, what you see is that in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, not really many people using the word tribalism. You know what happens in the 2000s and 2010s especially? That use of that word tribalism goes, choo, it just rockets up. Why? Why? Well, one of the central theses of the social dilemma is this idea, this is key, is that social media is not merely revealing and undergirding tribalism and undergirding fragmentation and undergirding polarity. It's actually catalyzing it. It's creating it. And so listen to this. I just went to Amazon and I typed in tribalism. And I'm going to read you, I don't know, six or seven book titles. I've not read, in fact, I've not read any of these books, but I want you to just listen to the titles of these books. Here we go. Hive Mind, The New Science of Tribalism in Our Divided World by Sarah Rose Kavanaugh. Our divided world. Number two, Political Tribes, Group Instinct, and the Fate of Nations by Amy Chua. 
the fate of nations. Number three, the red and the blue, the 1990s and the birth of political tribalism by Steve Kornacki and Ron Butler. Ooh, political tribalism. Number four, moral tribes, emotion, reason, and the gap between us and them by Joshua Green. The gap between us and them. That's tribalism by definition. Number, I think, five, suicide of the West. What? What? Suicide of the West, how the rebirth of tribalism, populism, nationalism, and identity politics is destroying American democracy by the well-known writer Jonah Goldberg. Two more, and listen to these. Our beleaguered species. What? Beyond Tribalism by Elizabeth Crouch Zellman. Our beleaguered species. And then finally, Ron Newby puts all of his cards on the table. Listen to this one. Tribalism, an existential threat to humanity. Okay, without having read any of those books, I can say this confidently. There are people that are observing the rise, the steep rise of modern tribalism, and they're concerned about it. They're so concerned about it that they're writing books, and not just books, but books with titles like Suicide of the West and Our Beleaguered Species and The Fate of Nations. Tribalism is on the rise. Now, what is tribalism? Well, I'm going to sort of set this up by recognizing that there's a difference between a tribe and tribalism. And this is easily illustrated. Take the word sex, for example, and by sex here we mean the word, we mean the word for gender, right? Male and female. There's nothing wrong with having men and women, male and female. Okay, but watch what happens when we add the suffix ism to the end, the suffix ism. Sexism. Now what we've created is a hierarchy based on difference, an essential ontological difference. Between males are superior, right? Chauvinism, right? Or I suppose there are even some that would say women are superior. Sex, no problem. Sexism, which is a hierarchy based on an immutable characteristic, no. How about this one? Race. We live in a wonderfully diverse world. We're going to get to that in just a second, and we use the term race for this. We talk about the black race and the white race and the Asian race and the indigenous races, and, and uh, of course, there's one race, the human race, but we use this language, and there's nothing wrong with that. People can say, oh, yeah, I'm Asian, or yeah, I'm black, or I'm you know, Maori, which are the native people of New Zealand. Nothing wrong, but watch what, watch what happens again, as with sex, when we add the suffix ism, racism. Now what we have is not just a differentiation of awareness of difference or distinction, but now we have a hierarchy of superior and inferior groups of people on the basis of immutable characteristics that they had no choice in? Absolutely not. And the same is true with tribe. There are all different kinds of tribes, right? There are economic, uh, economics maybe not the best word there, but I guess there would be economic tribes. But you have ethnic tribes, and you have linguistic tribes, and you have geographical tribes, and you even have like tribes that are built around stuff that you like to do. As I mentioned earlier, I'm a rock climber. And so my tribe are people that also enjoy rock climbing. If I meet climbers, I can immediately, immediately be like, hey, have you been to Joshua Tree this winter? Oh, how was the climbing? How did the shutdown affect it? You know, did you get on the Hobbit roof? You know, did you, what routes did you do? We can talk about Yosemite. We, can we all have our language. We have our vernacular. We have our locations that we meet. So there are recreational tribes. There are ethnic tribes. No, nothing wrong with having a group of people. I will sometimes refer to my church community. Hey, these, these are my people. This is my tribe. Nothing wrong. But what happens when we add again the suffix ism, tribalism? And this is what the writers like Chua and Goldberg and others are concerned about. The rise of tribalism is not just, hey, you do life that way, I do life this way. You know, I'm a rock climber, you're a mountain biker. I'm a rock climber, you're a, whatever it might be, a juggler or a unicycle rider, whatever there is. No, 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 no. The tribalism that's being described here is a tribalism in which there's not just difference, not just variety is the spice of life, but you're worse than me. You're, there's us, the people like me, and there's them. All of that homogenous group. In fact, when you read the New Testament, one of, the, one of the, the, the striking features of, of the New Testament and of Judaism, the Judaism of Jesus' day, was this radically bipartite world. The word bipartite means two parts, of Jews and Gentiles, us and them, as if the whole rest of the world was just a giant homogenous group of them. That's tribalism. That's tribalism. So sex, no problem. Sexism, problem. Race, no problem. Racism, big problem. Tribe, no problem. Tribalism, big
big problem. And the, 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 the sort of thesis of the social dilemma and of Lanier and of other writers and thinkers like them is that social media is not merely revealing a tribalism that was already there, it's creating it. I want to say that again. Social media is not merely revealing a tribalism that was already there, it is creating it. And it's right at this point that we take our pivot, we're beginning to set the table, and we're on our way now to those two Pauline passages that I mentioned at the outset, Galatians 3 and 1 Corinthians 9. And on our way, we're just going to pause for a moment and look at a passage from the last book of the Bible, Revelation, and a passage from the first book of the Bible, Genesis, and just bring those with us on our way to the writings of Paul, okay? So here's John, John the Revelator, who of course wrote the book of Revelation. He's on the island of Patmos, a penal colony, sort of 25 miles out into the Aegean Sea. I've been there. I've been to that colony. I've been to the very cave where John the Revelator received, uh, reportedly received the Revelation. One of the many incredible visions that John saw, and I, I, man, I'm just so passionate about this. I preached this a couple weeks ago, and a dear friend of mine, a dear sister of mine, Heather Day, Heather Thompson Day came up to me and she's like, I love what you said about Revelation 7. I've never thought of that text in that way before. That is mind blowing. In fact, she said to me, would you get on a Zoom call because I'm doing this diversity, inclusion and, uh, and equity training. Would you give a 15 minute version of what you just said? I said, sure, I did that yesterday and it went great, it went really great. So I'm going to try to explain to you what made such a powerful impact on Heather. Now watch this. John there, just get, your, get yourself in, in the mind. John is Get him in your mind. He's on the island of Patmos. He's looking through the corridors of time in prophetic vision, and he sees on the horizon, right? He sees on the horizon like an IMAX movie. He saw a lot of IMAX movies. It would have been, it would have been great. It's like better than Netflix. But, but what he saw here was incredible. This is in many ways the climax of the whole trajectory of Scripture. John says, After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude which no one could number. Okay, I'm just going to pause right there and say something. We sometimes get this idea that the saved, the redeemed, are going to be just the saintliest of the saintly. Just a few people that sneak in by the skin of their teeth. That's not what John saw. John saw, when he saw the redeemed, when he saw the saved there standing on the sea of glass, he said there were so many of them they were innumerable. They, I couldn't count them. They, were just, they just stretched out as far as the eye could see. And so... I know I can't hear you say amen, but maybe you could just say amen to that, that there's just going to be so many redeemed, right? That's what John saw. Now notice the next part. This is the real punchline, and I've underlined it for you here. Of all nations, multinational, of all tribes, multi-ethnic, of all peoples and of all tongues, multilingual, standing before the throne of God and before the Lamb. Now there's just a subtle little point here that you could easily miss, and I'm going to try to bring it out. When John is looking through, in prophetic vision, through the corridors of time, and he sees these people, he's seeing an actual historical event, right? It's a future event for him, but it's an event that's actually going to take place. He wasn't seeing like an animation movie. He was seeing the thing that's going to happen, and this is key. When he saw those people, that innumerable multitude, they were still, I want to say it again, they were still sufficiently unique, sufficiently diverse, that they were distinguishable in John's mind as a diverse and cosmopolitan and varied multitude. He saw them. They didn't all look the same. They were from every nation, tribe, people, and tongue. Now watch this. Standing before the throne of God and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, they're the redeemed, they're the saved, with palm branches in their hands, crying with a loud voice and saying, salvation belongs to, and you can't miss it because I've underlined it for you here, our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Now just let the glory of that, let the profundity of that and the beauty of that just settle into your mind. This diverse cosmopolitan, multilingual, multinational, multi-ethnic, multi-geographical people are all different enough that when John saw them, he's like, man, there's a lot of different kinds of people there. But what were they all saying? Salvation belongs to our God. There is no sense in which the one true creator God is worshipped only by a group of people that look a certain way, or think a certain way, or speak a certain way, or live in a certain area. God is the creator of the world with all of its glorious and beautiful diversity. And when John saw it, 
There was diversity, obvious, we've already targeted that, but there was also unity, our God. In fact, you might not know this, but I'm actually giving this presentation right now at a place called Southern Adventist University. Now, let me tell you something interesting about that word university. The word university comes from two words, uni, which means one, like unicycle, and versity, which comes from the same word as diversity, which means many. It's kind of like the Latin saying that we have on our money, e pluribus unum, out of the many, one. A university has many different academic disciplines. There's variety. There's the physics department, and the math department, and the nursing department, and the theology department, and the education department, and the psychology department, and the film department. Diversity with one pursuit, education, knowledge, university. What John saw there was a kind of celestial university. Diversity, but all of them saying collectively and even synchronously, salvation belongs to, say it with me, our God. Now, we shouldn't be surprised that that's what John saw because the, the very message, I'm just going to click through the rest of that. It go, the passage goes on to say that God wipes away every tear from their eyes. But the very message that was calculated to get this diverse multitude, this multilingual, multi-ethnic, multinational multitude, the message that was calculated to get those people there, the message of the gospel, watch this. Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 and 7, the first of what's sometimes called the three angels' messages. John says, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel. Do you know what that phrase means? It means the unchanging good news. Having the unchanging good news to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. There's that diversity. Saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. And worship Him. That's exactly what they were doing in Revelation 7. All standing around the throne of God and of the Lamb and saying, Salvation belongs to our God. Waving palm branches. That's worship. Why are they worshiping? They're worshiping Him as the Creator who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and the springs of waters. Which is incredible. All of that diverse, varied, cosmopolitan, multi-ethnic multitude, what do they have in common? They're all made in the image of God. So the message that was calculated to get them to Zion, to heaven, to the sea of glass, was calculated to be for a lot of different kinds of people, not just people that look and think and act and believe and behave just like me. A diverse cosmopolitan multitude. Now, one thing I'm going to say about this very briefly. These, these, the climax of Revelation, these people that are standing around the throne are also described a little bit later in Revelation. I don't have the text here for you, but you might be familiar with it. They're described as, as being inhabitants of the New Jerusalem. The New Jerusalem. Now, a fascinating thing about the New Jerusalem, as described by John in Revelation 21 and 22, is that it has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 gates. 12 gates? In the ancient world, if you've done much traveling and you know anything, maybe you've watched the History Channel, you know anything about the ancient world, if you had a walled city, what do you put a wall around your city for? Well, that's obvious. Protection. Right, for protection, particularly from enemies. And so how many gates would most ancient cities have? Well, I can tell you. The answer is most ancient cities had one primary gate. Some of them had two, primary, two gates, large gates. And then you'd have smaller gates that were more, much more easily defended and shut up. Well, why would you put only one gate, or two at the most, on most ancient walled cities? Well, the answer is obvious, isn't it? For protection. For protection. You want to keep people out. You want to keep the right people out and the right people in. So let me ask you this question. When John the Revelator saw that diverse cosmopolitan multitude, that group of people as being occupiers of the New Jerusalem, and then he says, oh yeah, there's 12 gates on that city. Let me ask you this question. Why would you put 12 gates on anything? Why would you put 12 doors on anything? Well, the answer is obvious, isn't it? You're trying to get people in. Access. You want as many people in as possible. Right? In, fact, in fact, John goes a step further. He actually says, not only are there 12 gates, he says, the gates never close. <laughs> the gates never close. And on those gates are the names of the 12 tribes of Israel, the descendants of a guy named Abraham. And so we go from the first or excuse me, the last book, Revelation, now to the first book, Genesis 12, 1, and 1 to 3. This is the initial embryonic nucleic promise that was made to 
Abraham about God's plan for the world. And I want you to see that it actually sounds a little like favoritism until the very end. Now watch this. The Lord said to Abram, this is from Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. Hey, Abram, get out of your country and from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. You're going to be a blessing. I'm going to bless those who bless you and I'm going to curse those who curse you. Now, if the, if, if, the, if the passage stopped there and there was a period, you would be fully justified in thinking that this sounds a lot like favoritism. Man, I'm going to bless you, Abraham. You're the bomb. I'm going to... Pr- Okay, it sounds like favoritism. You're my guy. I'm going to look out for you and not for those other people. Except when you read the modifying final clause. And in you, God says to Abraham, all the families of the earth will be blessed. All the tribes, all the people, all the languages. So you could say it this way. God in the Old Testament, which is the story of the descendants of Abraham, Israel, was not just giving the truth to Israel, he was giving the truth through Israel to the world. God's plan was always for everyone. In fact, you could say it this way, the hidden in plain sight secret. I like that. You like that? I like it. The hidden in plain sight secret of the Old Testament is that God wanted to expand Israel's influence to all the surrounding nations and then eventually to the world. It was never regional, it was never parochial, it was never tribal, it was always universal. In fact, when we then get all the way through the Old Testament and end up in the New Testament, right, Matthew, beginning Matthew, one of the things that becomes really obvious is that the insubordination and insularity of Israel, that's the descendants of Abraham, it seemed to thwart God's global vision, right? In fact, when we show up in the New Testament, the, the, the descendants of Abraham, the Jewish people, were so insular and so cut off from every other people that they were scandalized when Jesus' disciples were scandalized when he was, for example, speaking to a Samaritan woman. They wouldn't so much as you know, interact with a Roman or, you know, and in fact, I could just say this very briefly. In the Gospels, it is inescapably obvious that Jesus is purposefully and provocatively orienting himself to people who are on the fringes of first century Jewish society affirming a Roman centurion, letting a woman who was a bleeding, uh, uh, unclean woman touch the hem of his garment, talking to a Samaritan woman, calling just common fishermen, speaking to uh, publicans. And, and, you know, what was the great critique of Jesus by the religious leaders of his day? This guy eats and drinks with sinners. What's Jesus doing? He is saying, fellas, it's not an us and them club. It's not just the people that look like us, act act like us, think like us, believe like us. This message is for the world. What did Jesus say when he was sitting there next to that woman there on the, or actually she had left by that point, but in John chapter four, the woman at the well, he said, fellas, you say to yourselves, you say among yourselves, oh, there's only four months and then we're going to harvest. It's going to be a great harvest. And Jesus said, lift up your eyes and look. The fields are already white for the harvest because Jesus didn't take an insular, tribal, parochial view of reality. He took a global and inclusive view. Incredible. Jesus shows up in the New Testament as Israel, as God's anointed son. The New Testament overflows with evidence that God's saving vision from that initial embryonic nucleic promise to Abraham was always, say it with me, inclusive and global. The vision was always, in fact, that's what John sees. When John John looks, he sees a cosmopolitan, diverse, multi-ethnic, multilingual, multinational incredible variety, that multitude, but they're all saying the same thing. They're all saying the same thing. Salvation belongs to us. And now at this point, right here, the table is set, the hors d'oeuvres have come out, the appetizers have come out, and now we partake of the two main, the entrees, the the two main dishes in the meal. Galatians 3 and 1 Corinthians 9. And the table is so well set by the grace of God. I'm giving God all the credit here because it's not about the delivery. It's about the content. But theologically, the table is so well set. You're going to bite into these incredible biblical passages, which I believe, I believe, and this is my studied opinion. These are formative passages, definitive passages in the writings of Paul. I didn't just go grab two random passages from Paul. No, 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 no. These are shaping passages in Paul's Basic theology and basic methodology. We're going to spend our last several minutes on these. Galatians chapter 3. 
Paul writes to the church in Galatia, modern Turkey, and says, For you are all the sons of God through faith in the Messiah Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Now think about that. If we're all the sons and daughters of God, if we all have the same father, then that makes us brothers and sisters. Paul then proceeds on this premise that we're all brothers and sisters with the same father to begin to erase the major demarcations and distinctions of all different kinds that existed in his day. He says three times, there is neither Jew nor Greek, one. There is neither slave nor free, two. There is neither male nor female, three. For you are all one in the Messiah. Now let's just pause here briefly and note each, each of these. First of all, Jew and Greek was an ethnic distinction. It was a cultural distinction. It was a theological distinction. Right? And Paul feels comfortable just erasing that distinction. He says, yeah, 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 I know that your parents thought this way, and I know your grandparents thought this way, and I know your great-grandparents thought that the world was all about us and them, Jews and Greeks. He says, not anymore. And the second distinction, slave and free, we might be tempted in our modern Western context to think of this as only an uh, economic distinction, right? The rich and the poor, the haves and the have-nots. Oh, no. It was that, but it was more than that. It was an ontological distinction. Because... Basically, every nation, every culture, and especially the Hebrew culture, but not especially, the Hebrew culture, the Greek culture, the Roman culture, they all have thought of themselves as the better people, right? So there's, there's, again, not just difference, but there's hierarchy. It's the difference between sex and sexism, race and racism, a nation and nationalism, right? Where I see myself as superior to you in a cultural sense, in an ontological sense. And so when Paul says, he has the audacity to say, yeah, 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 that whole slave-free thing, not anymore. What? You're erasing an economic distinct? Watch where he goes with this one. There is neither male nor female, which again was not only a biological distinction, a physiological distinction, it was also an ontological distinction. Women were worth less in the minds of a great many in Paul's day than males. Now this is a key point, and if you miss this pivot, you're going to miss something very important. Paul is not here saying that these distinctions no longer exist. There were still Jews and non-Jews. There were still slave and free. There were still rich and poor. There were still males and females. Paul, if, if we could have gone up to Paul and say, Paul, are you saying that these distinctions no longer exist? That's not what he's saying, obviously. Anybody with eyes could discern that these groups, these identities still existed. So what is he saying? Key. Key. What he's saying is not that distinction or difference no longer exists, but it no longer becomes the basis upon which we relate to one another. Why? Why? Okay, think of it this way. Our identities, and we're going to get to this in just a second in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, our identities, what I call little I identities, are basically built around the stories, the little s stories that we tell ourselves. Right? So I have, I'm a layer, all of us are layers of identity, right? So... I am a male. That's a part of my identity. I'm a father. That's a part of my identity. I'm a husband. I'm a son. I'm an adopted son. I'm a rock climber. We have just, we're layers upon layers upon layers upon layers upon layers of identity. Nothing wrong with that. In fact, there's a lot right with it. That's what makes us all uniquely wonderful and it's great. Those are what I'm going to call little I identities. Not unimportant, not insignificant. Paul would say, yeah, 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 yeah. Fine. Fine. You can be from Wyoming. You can be a rock climber. You can be a, you know, a, a male who has teenage... These are all identities. But Paul says, you no longer relate to people on the basis of those little I identities because there's a big I identity. You are all sons and daughters of the Most High God, so you are one in the Messiah. You are all one in Messiah. So yes, difference exists. Yes, distinction exists. Yes, variety exists. And thank God for it. Thank God for it, right? Thank God for the incredible variety, variety of foods, variety, variety of looks, variety of hairstyles, variety of eyes, variety of, of, of size, variety of culture. Variety. Praise God for it. But when we make that difference, not just a differentiation, not just an awareness, but a standard or a hierarchy upon which we relate to others in a hierarchical way, looking down, no, 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 no. Absolutely not. Paul says, neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, neither male nor female. 
And then he says, somebody could come to Paul and say, hey, Paul, who do you think you are? Like, what gives you the right to just start erasing social distinctions and, you know, economic distinctions that have existed for centuries? And Paul would say, I'm so glad you ask. I'm so glad you ask. Because it's not me that's doing this. It actually traces back to that original embryonic Abrahamic promise. Check this out. If you are Christ, this is continuing with the same passage, Galatians 3, 26 to 29, then you are Abraham's seed And the Greek word here, seed, is sperma. It means descendants. It means family. You are heirs according to the promise. What promise? The promise. The promise that God would bless the world through Abraham. Paul had the theological right to erase those seemingly inviolable social distinctions because he was doing it based on the word of God and the plan of God, which was always, again, global and inclusive. Friends, this is not a denial of distinction or of difference. It's actually a celebration of it, but it's a reframing of it against this larger, better story, this larger, better identity, and that's the gospel story. That's the gospel identity. You can still preserve your layers of identity, but all of our horizontal identities are subordinated to the fact that we are the sons and daughters of the Most High God. You could say it like this. The gospel tribe, the gospel tribe is made up of people from all tribes. That's what John saw on the island of Patmos, and that's what we're seeing today in, the, in the pas- these passages of Scripture. And then our final, the, the final dish that comes to us, right? And we're just starting to get a little full, but there's a little room left. Just a little, a little 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse, uh, verse, uh, chapter 9, verses 19 to 23, shaped space right here. And this is where Paul says something that's incredible. The first was Paul's, the cornerstone of his theology, which is that God was blessing the world through the promises that he made to Abraham in Christ. Now, the second passage is Paul's methodology. When Paul traveled from town to town as a Jewish citizen, or excuse me, as as an ethnic religious Jew who was a Roman citizen and also uh, saturated in a Hellenistic culture, Paul knew how to move freely and easily from town to town, village to village, place to place. I've traveled in the Mediterranean world. It is as diverse a place as there is on earth, right? Because you have the convergence of Europe, you have the convergence of Asia, and the convergence of the north of Africa, all right there in the Mediterranean. This is, by the way, what Paul means later in this same book, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, a little bit later in verse 14, Paul says, writing to the church in Corinth, he says, I speak with tongues more than all of you. What he's saying is, I've traveled, man, I'm a well-traveled person. I know more languages than any of you. Paul knew how to slide into a situation in this town and slide into a different situation in this town and slide into a social context here and slide into a theological context here. Paul knew. He was a a well-traveled person. There's actually a fascinating word for this. The word is peripatetic. Paul was well-traveled. Now, look at what he says here. Paul says, for though I am free from all men. What does that mean? Does it mean he didn't owe people money? No, it actually means something even cooler than that. He says, my horizontal identities, my little I identity, not unimportant, but I'm not bound by those identities. I can be, and I'm going to create a word here that I hope you like. Paul is going to say, I can be, if necessary, chameleonic. I can adjust. I can adapt. I can shift. I can shimmy in different social, cultural, linguistic situations. I'm able to do that. I'm free from all men. I have identities, but I'm not a slave to those identities. What I am a slave to, I've made myself a servant or a slave to other people, which, by the way, is exactly what Jesus did, right? That's incredible to think about. Philippians chapter 2, he became a servant. Why would you do that, Paul? I mean, why wouldn't you just say, no, this is who I am, and this is my identity, and this is inviolable, and my culture, my people, my tribe, my way, my language. Why would you be so willing to be elastic and plastic and, and adaptable? Paul would say, I'm so glad you ask. I'm so glad you asked that. To the Jews, I became as a Jew. I know how to hang out with the Jews. Why would I do that? That I might win Jews. To those that are under the Torah, as under the Torah. The word here is law, but the the word means Torah. That's what Paul means, the writings of the Old Testament. To those as under the Torah, I know how to behave as under the Torah, so that I could win those who are under the Torah. To those that are without Torah, I know how to behave as without the Torah, Gentiles. Now, he makes an important parathetical qualifier here because people were always misunderstanding the stuff that Paul was saying, sometimes purposefully misunderstanding. He says, look, not being without Torah toward God, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying I'm under the Torah toward Christ. This evangelistic Torah, this this invitational Torah to invite the whole world to become participants in God's great 
vision, his, his inclusive and global vision. Why would you do that, Paul? Why would you comp Because I want to win those who are without Torah. To the weak I became as weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people so that, I purposely inserted the word so, so you cannot miss this. Paul, why would you be chameleonic? Why would you be so elastic and plastic and adaptable in these social environments and situations? Why wouldn't you stick rigidly and insistently to your I, little I identities? Paul would say, oh man, those, are, those identities are not unimportant, but I got a bigger thing I'm doing in the world. I have become all things to all people in a variety of social, geographical, cultural, linguistic situations so that by any means possible, I might save some. And so that we could not possibly misunderstand his motivation, he says, I do this for the sake of the gospel. The big S story. The big I identity. Paul says, sure, I'm a Jewish man. Yes, I'm a Roman citizen, but I can adapt. Not only can I adapt, I will adapt. And friends, it's right here in a, in a new normal world with, with political tribalism and, and nationalism and populism, all these things on the rise that are, the world is saying to us, no, you got to look out for people that look like you and act like you and think like you and believe like you. And the temptation is to draw inside of ourselves and, and, to be, and to hang out with only our people, my tribe, people that look, think, act, believe just like me. I know. Paul says, open up those arms, just as the arms of God are opened up to embrace a, 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 what was it? a diverse multitude, a cosmopolitan multitude. What did John see? Friends, as followers of Jesus in an increasingly fragmented and tribalistic world, we simply must keep the gospel story central in our thinking, in our relating to other people, and in our serving. That's what Paul says. I do this for service's sake. That's what Jesus did. And by the way, think about this. If God, as God, I mean, this is his identity. God's native identity is God. It's divine. If God is willing to provisionally surrender that identity to become a man for the purpose of service, friends, then what identity could you possibly cling to? What identity could you possibly cling to? I want to close with this incredible... By the way, by, by, by the way, when I say clinging to, you can cling to your identity. But right up to the point, right up to the point where the gospel identity and the gospel story takes over and for evangelistic purposes of getting as many people around that throne as possible, we can accommodate ourselves to others, not become rigid and inflexible and insistent and vehement now become large-hearted and magnanimous and generous and inviting to those around us, even those that we might disagree with or that we might have historically or culturally been at odds with, like the Jew-Samaritan division. Now, God can heal all of that. God can bring it all back together because of the great story of the promise that God made to Abraham and the faithfulness of that, the fulfillment of that promise through the faithfulness of the Messiah, Jesus. And when John looked down through the corridors of time, he said, man, I saw, I saw a multitude and no one could count them. Every nation, every tribe, every people, every tongue standing before the throne of God with palm branches in their hand. And what were they saying? Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Storyline, my appeal to you and my appeal to myself, my appeal to myself, is that we would not surrender our tribes. Hey, you can have your tribe. But subordinate all of your tribes, all of your stories, and all of your identities to the big T, to the big S, and to the big I, the gospel tribe, the gospel identity, the gospel story. Because God loves everyone just as much and just as energetically and enthusiastically as He loves you. Now take that love and go share it with the world by God's grace and through the infilling of His Holy Spirit. Thank you all so much. It's been great to be with you today.